Anyway, I'm going to talk about how to get stems, good stems. I better get on this side. Oh, yeah. There's your little, you know, which one is uh, we have yeah. 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 Uh, Brassica Corp is my company. Um, I'm president of, if I need coffee, I've got to go get it myself. <laughs> it was just a tax issue. Rather than do all my consulting through uh, personal income, uh, it makes a difference. It's been a very successful company. <laughs> Anyhow, I retired 10 years ago, and I have worked with canola and rapeseed for 50 years, so I know a little bit about it. I'm still learning. Every time I walk fields, I usually pick up something. But I like this particular slide. Uh, I've had to boil it down a little bit. There's about 143 different factors that we have to consider when we're growing a crop of canola. And a lot of them don't mean very much. Well, you know, we can't change all those green ones very much. We can modify them to a little bit of degree. The biggest factors that we have to look at that have the most uh, value to you is over on this side here. In our fertility area, it has the biggest bang for your buck on yield. Uh, a lot of these purple ones, uh, some of them aren't very important. If you do it right, it might only be 1% yield. If you do it wrong, it's only minus one. But when you start adding up 25 or 30 of them, all of a sudden it becomes a little bit more important. Uh, I'm going to touch on just a few of these as we go along. That one will do it. These are yields I personally have seen. We don't touch the genetic capability of the varieties we grow. We don't even come close to it. This particular one at Mossville, Idaho uh, was just unbelievable. It was a, a Canadian hybrid, the first Canadian hybrid that came out, and I was on the recommending committee at the time, and we rejected it <laughs> uh, because it had high saturated fat level in the oil. And uh, the Americans approved it, <laughs> and they had this field scale uh, farm just outside of Moscow, Idaho, and I walked into it. It was about this tall. It started potting from above there, and it was just, I, Wow, I couldn't even estimate what the yield was. I said, well, it's obviously over 100, but I wasn't sure. But in, in Lethbridge, under irrigation, where we grow our varietal trials every year, four out of five years, we're hitting 120 on irrigation. So water is one of our most limiting factors ever in Western Canada. And look at even Beaver Lodge. Uh, trials at Beaver Lodge and Fort Vermillion are in that 70 bushel per acre range. Uh, how often are you guys hitting uh, 70 range up here? <laughs> it, it, it is possible. If everything worked correctly out of those 143 factors, it is possible. Uh, right at Lacombe, where I, where I live, uh, I tell our guys that they should be looking at a 55 bushel per acre average target. Very few people do that. But our clients, we had clients two years ago uh, that hit the 80 mark. And so we're, we're getting closer all the time. We have to put a realistic target every year. We've got to put a realistic target. And how do you do that? Well, I like to use our 30 year average rainfall, which doesn't occur all that often. I know what's happened up here in the last five years. I like to look at the growing degree day averages so I can pick a variety that's going to fit better. I want to know what our 30 year frost average is, which is kind of difficult. And I want to know what soil limitations because you do have some soils up here that are uh, solidized solanetic, for example. And they are a bit more difficult to work with. I want to know what the water requirements of that target is. Now I go back a long way to some research work that was done by Ag Canada that showed one inch of water is equivalent to about 2.75 to 3.6 bushels per inch of water. 
And I said, no, boy, that's inefficient. How can we improve it? We now have clients that are up to eight bushels per inch water. How do you make water use efficiency with your crop is really critical because it is the most limiting factor worldwide, not just in Western Canada. Uh, to do that, you really have to look at the whole use of water. Uh, uh, I've got that, that's the same slide, I should have dumped that. But if this is just an example to show you water use efficiency between various crops. We're looking at a, a not very good management, a little bit better, and where we're really properly targeting yields. And you can see we're getting up to some pretty good levels on canola there, about seven bushels per inch of water. The first four inches of water the crop will use doesn't go to yield. It goes to building that manufacturing plant that you really need for photosynthesis. But the reason why canola is not as water use efficient, it takes more energy to make oil than it does starch. So it, it, it will never match the, the cereals in that case. And field peas, what are you producing? Huge amount of protein, and uh, it's not quite as water use efficient as, as the uh, canola is. The water that goes into the plant is huge. When you think of it, look at flowering. We're already up to about nearly seven millimeters of water used per day. Under irrigation, that's about 22 inches of water being put on. It's a huge amount of water. Up here, you don't have that option. And so we have to make sure that we're increasing the water use efficiency as much as possible. There's a huge <laughs> number of factors involved in getting a good plant stand. And I just thought I'll throw that up. There's a major input from our environmental conditions. When you put the seed in the ground, what happens? Uh, seed quality, uh, a lot of factors. I'm not going to go through uh, most of them, but we've got to, first of all, decide on what our population target is. How many plants do you truly need for canola? And what's your row spacing? What's your seed bed utilization going to be? Uh, seeding practices are going to be major inputs on how many plants you actually have coming up out of the ground. Uh, what kind of tillage system you have, whether it's conventional or whether it's zero till or reduced tillage. Uh, do you have seedling diseases up here? Oh boy, do you ever. Anytime I walk fields, there's a huge amount of rhizoctonia. And it, in some cases, it's because of how it was handled, the levels that occur. What your soil characteristics? You have a, acidic soils mainly throughout the piece. I've walked fields in, in, in the piece that are at 3.4 pH. If I put my hand in there with water and kept it there for four hours, it would take skin off my hand. And yet, we're growing canola on that type of soil. That happened to be up at Wood Creek, but uh, uh, wood ash is an alternative on some of those pH, uh, low pH. Um, I, just get going here. Here's one that, uh, this is from Ag Canada, it shows, hey, we've got a situation that there's a whole bunch of factors involved. Soil type, soil texture, uh, soil pH, which I mentioned, growing degree days, where you are in latitude, you're the farthest north canola producing area in the world except for Finland and, and Sweden. Uh, soil organic matter. How much organic matter do you have? What's the nitrogen release capability of that soil? And uh, how much rainfall do you get? On average? <laughs> the last five years don't count, do they? Wow. Uh, we want fields like this. You know, very uniform. And what's really critical is what's below that guy. And you start looking at, this is the power of the plant right there. You don't want those bottom leaves dropping off until you start hitting the early stages of ripening. If they do, that means that something's missing out of the package that you've got there. 
that may be drought. <laughs> but we want to maintain that photosynthetic area as much as possible. I can tell pretty close what your yield capability is at elongation based on the amount of leaf area index that you have. And a leaf area index is very simple. A one square meter, uh, an index of two says in one square meter, I've got two square meters of leaf surface area that are going to do all the photosynthesis, make all the sugars and all the stuff that that plant actually needs to set up its productive stage, which is in the flowering area. Uh, you look at this, this happened to be a, <laughs> a neighbor. He's one of our agri coaches, actually, with Agritran, and he switched drills. What happened? Went too deep. Absolutely. He said uh, that drill uh, was going when he ended the year. He said, that's it. Never use it again. Made a huge difference. Uh, we used to think that seed needs liquid water to germinate. And, we, oh, <laughs> uh, someone's running out of power here. What do I do that? Oh. Did I step on it? No. <laughs> no problem. But the seed has to absorb 45% of its weight in water to start the German and to get it up out of the ground. Uh, what we've found over, over years is that a large proportion of the water it absorbs it is actually in the water vapor form, not liquid water. Only 15% of its water requirements come from liquid. Uh, so you start thinking, okay, you're creating the ideal seedbed condition. Uh, we know that there's a huge amount of capillary action in the soil of water moving up and into the water vapor form. So in most <coughs> cases, especially up here, this year is going to be a real good year because of your snow cover. We're actually going to have a very good soil seedbed moisture situation. Fortunately.